And you guys got that thought it was pretty cool though, but uh, one, of the, one of the topics Gigi was talking about was her triggers like hit up on her serve, which is kind of what we're trying to get you guys to do with all your players, right? Have that mental rehearsal, optimist, optimistic kind of inner dialogue kind of thing. All right, so what we're doing right now, we're on page 68. This is that one uh, singles mental chapter. So the quick review is, in my opinion, the mental game of tennis, mental toughness, is the X's and O's of strategies, tactics, understanding who you are, your best game, understand how to beat the different styles of opponents, opponent profiling could be categorized in the mental side. And the emotional side is dealing with performance anxieties and choking, panicking, fear, nervousness, how to close out a lead, so and often it gets really entangled and mixed up. You see a lot of times parents go, my kid's not mentally tough. She cries all the time. Well, that's probably more emotional toughness, right? And then the mental part of strategy. All right, so here's the top of that page. I'll profile my opponent's game. Um, we want to make sure that your athletes are doing this. They recognize the opponent's style. So if we were sitting here with your student looking at players on these courts, our students hopefully should be able to say, that's a retriever, that's a hard-hitting baseliner, that's an all-court net player. We want our students to be able to profile styles, right? Be careful, though, when you're teaching young girls, because when you say, profile the style, they're going to say things like, I don't know about that Nike skirt with the Adidas top. That's what the girls are going to be supposed to say. That's not what we're talking about. Um, spotting their top seven patterns. That's critical at the higher level. So we know that we want you guys to have your go-to patterns, do what you do best on big points, right? But also, what if you can start to spot your opponent's top seven? So here's an example. Uh, one of the things I do every week with top players in California is we do a match play video analysis. So we, we put the little pole up on the top fence, we videotape, the real match. One hour a week of their lessons is not even hitting a ball. All we're doing is profiling the real match. And that's really, really important though in maximizing their potential at a faster rate. So let's do some information sharing. What can you help teach? What can you gain knowledge with these students? What can you help with watching real matches? Video analysis, watching a real match. Okay, so, yeah, so, efficiencies, efficiencies. Okay, so, stroke mechanics, right? You, you can stroke mechanics. Opponent profiling. Movement footwork, right? Are they running their top seven patterns? Are they staying on script? So you can spot all this stuff when you watch videos of real matches. It used to be when I was younger, in the 80s, videotaping was standing on the court with the, the camera, now it's, coach's eye, the app, right? You stand on the court and you just videotape fundamental strokes. That only tells you one tenth of the picture as to why people are winning or losing. So I think it's really important that you sit with the student and suss out the art of winning. Why are they winning or losing game sets matches? And the, one of the last things we're gonna talk about is the match chart collection. You guys are gonna get this book, email, so the second book you're gonna get is the Math Chart Collection. Here's one of the books, uh, sorry, one of the charts in the book. It's called uh, the Cause of Error Chart. And there's 10 kind of fun, unique charts. So the Cause of Error Chart, you can do that in your math video analysis. But here's the Cause of Error Chart. It's pretty basic. You categorize four basic causes of errors. And here's one of them. Stroke mechanics, that could cause errors. Right or wrong? Stroke mechanics. The second one is reckless shot selection. Choosing the wrong and appropriate shot. That could cause errors. The third is movement and spacing. Poor movement and spacing could cause errors, right? And the last is emotions or focus. That could cause errors. But we want to know what's causing the error. So in the past 10 years, I would get phone apps, uh, and I would get reports from parents. And they would say, my little Kelly made 28 backhand mistakes in the match. 
and they would expect me to come out with a basket of balls, feed balls, and correct Kelly's backhand form. But what if Kelly, out of 28 errors, what if 22 were reckless shot selection? Would working on her form help? No. You're wasting time. You're not even working on the cause of the error. See the difference? So it's really important, and I'm going to make sure you guys all get the, all those charts. And one of the things I want you to do when you get all these charts, I do this a lot with college teams. It's super critical. Have two college players chart and then two or four players play. The kids that are charting, even in 10 and unders, it's incredible how fast they, they digest information when they're charting. So even if they're doing a basic unforced error to win or chart, you get a 10-year-old and they're like, Joey, man, you made 28 errors and two winners. They know, and now they really buy into it more. But if you or the parents say after the match, you know what, parents lock them in the back seat of the car, like a prison transport, and they're yelling at them about the errors, they're not gonna pay attention. But if they're charting, they do. So have your players chart during your group sessions. Okay, identify the opponent's frustration tolerance level. What does that mean? Anybody? Frustration tolerance. You want to pay attention to what's causing the opponent to be frustrated, right? At lower levels, we see players chuck their racket and they go, I hate my backhand. And that's easy to read. But at the higher levels, it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, recognize the opponent's shot tolerance. That's how many balls they can get in before they start doing something crazy. I think that's important. Uh, if you know your opponent can only get three balls in, you don't need fancy, intricate patterns. You just need to hit three, four balls deep down the middle until they implode. Understanding their shot tolerance. Let's go through score management. Um, Gals, can you read that part about positive and negative game points? All right, who's up there? Sarah's going to go first. 68. Um, let me go on something a little bit more detailed. You know what we all talk about, we talk about as coaches? Pay attention, it's a big point. This is a big point, pay attention. But there's a difference between a positive game point and a negative game point. A positive game point is when your player is up 40 love, 40 15, 40 30. They have a lead. They can play to win a little bit more. A negative mega, a mega point is what? They're down. They're down 40, love. Should they be trying to paint the line returning a first serve when they're down? We have to teach that, the difference between a positive and negative game point. You get it? It's a little bit deeper. Instead of just saying, it's a big point, pay attention. Uh, let's go through. I know some of this stuff is just basic, but I think our junior players or even some adult league people don't know it. So let's read through zonal tennis. Yeah. All right, come on. Okay, court zone percentages. I hit the shot, the zone demands. If the ball lands short, I attack. If the ball lands mid-court, I apply building shots. If the ball lands deep, I hit high and heavy. Air zone percentages. When I'm inside the court, I aim two to three feet above the net. When I'm around the baseline, I aim four to five feet above the net. When I'm behind the court, I aim eight feet above the net. Cool. Hey, let's give her a round of applause. That's your first. <laughs> U30. U30 teaching. Hey, um, if you guys, if you're doing this type of mental rehearsals and you're organizing scripts with athletes, first thing I think it's big is try to remember each athlete is going to have their own unique answers. And that's okay. You want to help mold the correct answer to the player. The second thing is, is, it, is it kind of a question, but is this going to help them with their confidence under pressure? What do you think? Is writing their scripts and then listening to their scripts before they play, is it going to help prepare them for pressure? Yeah, of course, right? So remember, old school is go out and warm up a couple strokes and go play. Well, you're only warming up your strokes. What if you're warming up mental and emotional? It's a big difference. Um, when they're confident, 
It really fortifies their game. But to me, I think when they're unknowingly overconfident or underconfident, it destroys their game in matches. So we want to make sure that uh, they're right on the money there. So let's go to the next one. We're almost done with this chapter. Uh, broad vision, uh, anticipatory clues. This is kind of the art of anticipating. So I'm going to share with you guys a study we did back at the old Vic Braden Tennis College. I think it was Bausch and Lomb did this $100,000 study to prove uh, that pros keep their eyes on the ball. Funniest thing was pros do not keep their eyes on the ball all the time. It's a myth. So what happened was we had these hard baseball cap type of helmets with a camera that looked right into the eyes. And when the ball was incoming, so the ball's coming to you, the term we used was narrow vision. You're tracking the ball, the, you're watching the ball, you, uh, you watch it bounce come up, right? Now when the ball leaves your racket and it goes towards the opponent's side, guess what pros did? They didn't just watch the ball. They shifted to broad vision. Yeah, yep, it's like looking at, when you're driving a car, you look out the windshield and you see the brake lights, you see the red light turning yellow, you see the kids with the ball, you're, you're picking up big clues, right? So it's important that we don't teach players to always keep your eyes on the ball. If you do, you're going to miss all the clues that Roger Federer spots. You get it? So let's go through broad vision. I'm going to give you a couple things. Uh, well, let's have the girls read what the Harvard player wrote. Ladies, take it away. The ball is leaving my racket. All right, so you guys, when the ball is going over, it's re re real quick. It's important that you know what zone your ball is landing in. Because that determines whether they're on offense, neutral, defense. You want to pay attention to their strike zone. If I'm lunging and the ball is down by my socks, am I on offense or defense? Defense. defense. If I'm backing up, backing up, backing up, and hitting a ball above my head, defense. If I'm moving inside the court, waist level, offense. And so there's a lot of fun drills you can do to pick up these uh, anticipatory clues. And if anybody wants a list of those kind of drills, let me know after, and I'll give you a bunch of drills you can do with your, with your team. The thing that's interesting to me about anticipation is that half of the speed around the court is not footwork. It's brain work. It's cognitive processing speed. That's why some people overthink and hesitate when they play. And you watch the same kid when they run laps later, and they're the fastest guy out there, or one of the fastest guys. But in a match, they have, they have all these contaminants in their brain, and they can't focus on what they should be focusing on. So there's some drills for that, too, that might help brain speed. And, and we, don't, we don't have all day with this. I usually do six hours a day when I do these things, so we've got to really condense this stuff. But. Uh, let's go margins. Gal, read, can you guys read about margins? Margins. All apply safe margins by aiming three feet above the net and three feet inside the lines. Cool. How about the next one? Controlling the baseline. Number one, I'll choose to hit forehand 70% of the time. Number two, I'll choose to hit backhand 30% of the time. Do you guys take your individual students when they're playing singles and if they like their forehand, they really feel it's a weapon, do you try to get them to use forehands at least 70% of the court and only backhands 30%. We do that a lot in California where it's, it's not just down the middle if it comes to this side, it's a backhand. That's old school. How about, can, uh, how about uh, approaching the net wisely, gals? One, I'll divide the width of the court into two zones, two long and short ball balls landing in the center five feet from the net. Number two, I'll choose to hit forehands 30% of the court. So, Let's review that real quick, approaching the net wisely. If, if we're going into the net, any ball from the sideline to 75% of the court, we approach the backhand. If it's in the 25%, we go up the line to the forehand on the approach. You get it? 75, 25, it'll help you with your positioning. These are just some basic things that you guys can do to work on the mental side of tennis. Okay, Gal, let's read the two tactical 
changes to consider when you're losing a match? Two tactical changes to consider when losing. Number one, raising my level. Hit harder, closer to the lines, and attack successfully. Number two, sabotage their level. Moon ball, drop, slice, or jump ball. Okay, so I think that's important that for a lot of, especially club players, it's okay if they have a B plan of sabotage the other person. Have we all lost the people that sabotage your game? They junk ball you to death. And, but it, so it works. And for some of our athletes, you might want to add that as a viable means that they can bring people in and throw a little junk. And it's okay for some people at some levels. Um, Self-destruction solutions. Let's, uh, let's read number one. Okay, so we want our athletes to have a contingency plan. It's called self-destruction solutions. Do the first one just hit three balls down the center? Back when uh, Sam Quarry was young, he played his first uh, U.S. Open on Arthur Ashe against Rafa. And so he loses two sets in a row. He says he couldn't even see the ball. He's shanking everything. He's pulling out early. Then he remembers when he was a kid his self-destruction solutions. And his was just aim three balls deep down the middle. Still hit hard, but just down the middle. And he ends up winning the third set against Rafa. And then he loses the next set to win the match. But he wins the set when he was young by going back to his self-destruction solution. So I think all of our athletes should have at least one or two of these solutions if they're really losing to a toad. You know what I mean by that? Somebody if they think they should be beating. Yeah, till they get confidence back. A lot of times I see it with juniors going into their first like national tournaments. They want to prove to everybody else that they're so good that they go out to start painting lines and now they lose to people that aren't even that great instead of sticking to their script. All right, last couple of things here, and we're going to move on. This is part of their, obviously, part of their strategic strip, script. Uh, if my game isn't working and I'm losing to a retriever, backward retriever, I'll pull them out of their comfort zone by girls. Hey, applying my short angle, side door, building shots, and patterns. B, applying my moon ball approach to swing volley or drop volley pattern. C, I'll hit drop shots, bring the opponent into the net, and then pass or lock. All right, so let's review this. If, you're a, if your athlete is losing to a retriever, it's totally fine if they're wired to be retrievers. Uh, you can even just ask them to pack a lunch and out push the pusher. If they're not wired to play that style, now they have to develop their, their primary and secondary strokes. Remember that from this morning? Primary, secondary? So I want to ask you guys some questions. Applying your short angle shots, is that a primary or secondary stroke you're developing? Secondary, secondary right on. How about moon ball approach to swing volley or drop volley? Are those primary or secondaries? Secondary. Yeah. Are you gonna, is your athletes going to be able to execute a swing volley if you don't practice swing volleys? No. A lot of old school coaches go, no, man, it's too risky. Don't ever do a swing volley. Well, it's only risky if you don't practice it. If you go out there and practice it, you own it. Now, interesting for me, a lot of brain types, like the introvert, uh, sensate thinkers, inside their, your mind right now, if you're wired like that, you're going to say, no, that's not right. I, they should just be safe. But remember, what's safe for you is not always safe for them. So look, if I'm an aggressive player that's not super patient, if they throw up a move, and I run back five or six steps, and I re-moon ball it. Whose game am I playing? Yours or theirs? Theirs. You just got sucked into a moon ball battle. That's only a matter of time before you take ass and lose. Now, instead of going back five steps, what if you go in four or five steps and just take the swing volley out of the air? Now, whose game are you playing? Yours. And tennis is a game of time management. Time management means you have to buy time and steal time, right? So you cream it in the corner. There by the alley. They throw up a moon ball. You go in five steps, take the swing volley. They're still by the alley. They can't recover. 
But if you run back, now they can just walk back to the middle and restart the moon ball rally. See, so that's time management. So and it, I got to tell you, it's super easy to do things like swing volleys. We have to just practice it. Uh, when I was with Molly, a young WTA player, this is about eight or nine years ago at Miami, we're practicing right next to Venus Williams and her dad. So Richard had a box of tennis balls and he had a cigarette in his mouth. And he's throwing up swing volley, swing volley to Venus. And it's beautiful. He's just having her come in, swing volleys, come in, swing volleys. We're watching a little bit after playing. Then we leave Key Biscayne. We leave. We go eat lunch away from the site. We come back to the site. We park. We walk by the same practice court. They're still doing swing volleys, like hour and a half. That's practicing secondary strokes. And that's, that's cool. That's what we should all be kind of teaching our, our kids. So last thing is, if you hit a drop shot, bring them in. Hit a dipper and a lob. Are those primary or secondaries? Secondaries. So let's try to make sure that in the realm of primary and secondaries, we're, we're teaching the whole tool belt. And your, the college coaches are going to thank you when your kids go off and get the big scholarships because now they don't have to teach that stuff. All right, so here's something I want you to write down if you are writing down things. It's a slogan of mine. Practice in the manner you're expected to perform. Practice in the manner you're expected to perform. Remember, tennis is a game of keep away. It's not a game of catch. Only in the, the beginning... The beginning levels, when you're just social, you're not even really keeping score, you're just playing catch back and forth. And that's cool. That's fun. But if you're going to compete, now it becomes a little bit of the game of keep away, right? So we want to make sure our kids are training like that. Okay, let's read, let's read number three, gals. If, you're, if your game's not working and you're losing to a hard-hitting baseliner, what's your plan? All right, Sarah. Hey. I'll focus on getting 75% first serves in, especially to their backhand. I don't want to give them any second serves to crush. C, I'll focus on more depth, applying my high and heavy ground strokes, which is in the back, keeping the ball out of the primary to right in. Cool. All right, A, mixing the spin, speech, and trajectories. Is that primary or secondaries? What do you think if you're doing high and heavies and then short slices and then drives? It's kind of secondaries too, right? It's a little bit of both. Uh, focus on getting 75% of first serves in. Uh, I think that applies too against net rushers. The first time, this is going to show my age, but the first time I saw that, 1986, Cincinnati, Ohio, Matt Vilander. You guys remember that name? Anybody? Yeah? Playing a six hours Davis Cup match against McEnroe. And he didn't hit first serves hard at all. He just spun him into McEnroe's backhand to make McEnroe stay back and rally from the baseline. If Matchelander missed a first serve, what did John McEnroe do? Attack. Nowadays, they just come in and crush it, right? They probably don't go to the net as much, but that's big. All right, so last thing with this chapter of your athlete's shield of armor. We want to make sure when to choose building shots versus winners. So let's read through when they shouldn't be going for big winners. Returning a serve, rallying a deep ball, or on a negative mega point. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? I know that Gigi did a lot of doubles, so we're, the, next, the next page is doubles essentials. We're going to hold off on that. I think you guys might have got enough doubles. But obviously you have your own, um, you know, you, you have your, your scripts right here. But I want you to go to a different page instead. Let's do page 51. Go to page 51. This is going to require a little bit more reading from the gals, but I want you to read along. I was talking to, to Billy about this earlier, but this whole chapter is about life skills, character traits, moral compass. It's really important that us as tennis coaches, we're teaching these skills. The more we teach all these life skills, the better. Uh, if your athletes have these life skills, they're going to practice smarter, more efficiently, better quality versus quantity. 
They're going to be prepared more. So we're going to kind of bang through some of these. So obviously, if they have great life skills, their practices are more purposeful. If their practices are better, they're going to win more matches. Get it? If they have horrible life skills, they're going to show up to tennis late. They're going to be on their cell phone all the time. They're going to forget their shoes. You know, all the stuff that we, that we see with like more hobbyist kind of approaches, right? All right, so the way this works is you're going to have your athletes self-grade from 1 to 10. 1 means they think they're really bad, they're horrible at the skill set. 10 means they already think they're great at it. So, gals, let's read time management. All right. Time management life skill is the ability to use one's time effectively or productively. A successful athlete with strong time management skills to organize daily, weekly, and monthly scheduling the development of each of the four major components, technical, athletic, mental, and emotional, are essential to be at the higher levels. <laughs> Very good. There's a gal in California I taught, which went starting from like 11. And she won 2010 US Open doubles and, and Wimbledon doubles. And she has all of her weekly planners. So each year, we did a workshop and she brought all of her weekly planners to show all the, all the new kids. So each week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, she wrote down her whole script of things she's working on. And it's really important that the kids that do that get really accountable. So here's what I mean by your weekly planner. You know the school methodology? Kids go to school and they do an hour of math, science, then maybe English, right? Do they do math all day, every day for 12 years? No. They want to be well-rounded, right? That's the whole objective. The same thing for you guys as tennis coaches. You don't want to teach only fundamental strokes all day, every day. That's only one class. So you have, I'm going to go through the classes. You have off-court in the gym, med balls, bands. They should be doing that, especially if they want to play college ball. Off-court cardio is a whole different class. Speed, agility, stamina, right? That kind of stuff. That's a class. Primary strokes is a class. Secondary strokes is a class. Pattern repetition, like top seven patterns. That's a class. You get it? Video analysis is a class. Playing practice matches is a class. We want our kids to be doing math, science, English, not just hitting fundamentals back and forth all day. That gets you nowhere fast. I have a question. How many hours do your serious players play practice matches in a week, one week. How many hours of practice matches? Give me some numbers. How many hours a week are they playing practice matches? Four. About four hours? What else? Full matches, not just points. Yeah, no, real matches. Where they're being accountable, they're being judged, they have to close out and finish. Come on, you guys know, think about it. Okay, okay, so zero, okay. So let's go through this. Now let's say they do get into a big national. Now I'm just throwing out my experience. You guys can totally disagree and that's okay too. But this is kind of what I've been through. So let's say they get into like Easter Bowl, Orange Bowl, a national, okay? 64 draw. Who's good at math? Who's a good math wizard here? Come on, somebody goes math. There's gotta be somebody. That's why you're all tennis pros. <laughs> 1534. All right, you got to do the math for me. Ready? Come on, because you spoke up. All right, here's the math. Round to 64. They're in, a, they're in a 64 draw tournament. They win in two sets. This is a one week national tournament. How many matches, how many sets did they play so far? How many sets? They split. Well, let's say they won in two. Two, right? Okay, round to 32, they won in three. Five. Okay, round to 16, they win in two sets. Seven. Right? Now, uh, quarters, three sets? Ten? This is hot, I know, for us, right? Wait, I got my calculator. Semis, they went in two. Twelve. Finals, they went in two. Fourteen. Now, let's just say they're in a smaller national and they only have to win a pro set in doubles. Okay, remember, you already have 14. Now, we're going to add round to 64 doubles, round to 32. What do you add? Sixteen sets in a week, right? Okay, keep going. Round of 16? What's that? 
I already lost count. 15 yeah, sets? 17 sets? Yeah. Um, holy God, when was the last time my players played that? <laughs> Semis, finals, you get the idea. So if they're going to go and actually win a tournament like their parents think they're going to, they have to physically, mentally, emotionally be ready to compete for about 20 sets in a week. If they practice zero, they're just going to get a tan and a t-shirt. That's it. I mean, reality, man. All right, so uh, let's, we're going to do uh, adaptability. Let's read that one, you guys. The adaptability life skill is being able to adjust to different situations and conditions comfortably. To get the most from your physical talent, one must be open to change. Adapting is emotional intelligence at work. Okay, let's read the next one. Handling adversity. Handling adversity is a critical athletic life skill. Competition brings hardship, drama, and suffering along with a positive attitude. Yeah. Overcoming daily problems is a driving yeah. force of change. Seeing adversity is a, as a challenge versus, versus a life or death crisis. Is Can you guys try to get the parents and athletes? even the league players, to look at matches as information gathering missions, not life or death crisis. Right? We're just, you're playing this match, we're going we're gonna to check out your efficiencies, deficiencies. You get it? Um, let's read handling stress. Great skill. Handling stress. Stress causes biological and mental tension. It occurs when one believes that their physical skills aren't strong enough to meet the challenge. While some personalities stress more than others, proper preparation and a positive attitude dramatically reduce stress levels. Um, <coughs> handling stress, handling adversity is super important. <laughs> but this is also why I do a lot of tennis parent workshops. Um, let me give you a, a scenario. I'm, I'm in Southern Cal, I'm down in Laguna Beach. A family calls me from San Francisco and they go, my daughter is only... 13, she beats all the 17-year-olds in the academy. She's incredible, but when we go to tournaments, she can't beat anybody. And they're like, what gives? Why is she so good in practice, but in tournaments when we take her, she's no good? So they come down there, they fly down. It's about an hour flight. So they come down, we spend a couple of days. I have the parents go to Starbucks when we're talking to the kids a little bit. And so Here's what kind of happens as we kind of unwind and uncoil this stuff. Martha Kalowski is the mom. So she drives the athlete Saturday. So she's already upset about the outfit Kelly picked out. She's yelling about the traffic. She's mad about the directions. Uh, she's mad about parking. And already she's totally frazzling Kelly like mad before the match. And, and kind of like diffusing everything that we talk about as far as stress relief. So Kelly loses first round. Next day of the same tournament, the dad Peter drives. So now Peter's driving. So we have this got to be better, can't be any worse. It's actually worse. So Peter drives and his whole pre-match speech, motivational speech is even, is even worse. He said things like, uh, we just spent $2,000 to get here, don't blow it. You're playing a top seed. If you beat her, you're going to go up to here with your ranking. If you lose, your ranking's going to drop. All these things, get it? So as far as you guys de-stressing, you might have to start doing tennis parent workshops too. At least meet sometimes with the, with the parents. And if you need my help, let me know. I can help you with that part a little bit. Um, you guys remember this pro named Anna uh, Ivanovich? Okay. I was at the Australian Open. Her, mom, her mom's name is Dragana. Okay, she's sitting on the practice court. Her legs are crossed. Her arms are behind her back. And she is so chill. She's just feeling the sun, relaxing. And that's exactly opposite of the parents of the juniors that we teach. They're usually going a little bit, you know, a little bit nutso. So. All right, let's go. Girls that do perseverance and courage. Perseverance. Perseverance is one's ability, ability to stay on course through setbacks, discouragement, injuries, and losses. It is the ability to fight stubbornly to achieve greatness. Cool. Yeah. Courage. Courage is the ability to apply belief in your skills in spite of the threat at hand. Of course, if you aren't training at 100%, true courage doesn't exist. 
Courage is knowing that competition in sports is to be embraced and not feared. Courage is not allowing yourself to listen to the typical noise of, what if I lose? Okay, Sarah, do one more. Work ethic. Work ethic is a diligent, consistent standard of conduct, strengthening physical, mental, and emotional components, and the attainment of goals is dependent on a deliberate, personalized plan and hard work. Very good. So remember we talked about the idea about a weekly planner. That is your athlete's deliberate, customized, developmental plan. Each week they're hitting those different classes. Remember we, we use the analogy of the school methodology in math science. Let's try to make sure that your players aren't doing 15 hours a week of just grooving fundamentals, but they're not doing any of the other stuff. Because that, that's big, in my opinion. So, Remember, here's how this chapter is going to look, and when you guys read through it later, you'll, you'll get it, but they're going to grade from 1 to 10, the athlete's confidence level and that skill. If they grade 7 or below, what I want you to do is ask the athlete to do some homework. So it says go home, Google that word, courage, maybe. Google that word, maybe even YouTube it, and have them find out uh, and organize their own preset solutions to getting better at courage. So we want athletes to be accountable and problem solvers. So it's not in our best interest to solve the problem for them. We have to just show them how to solve their own problems. Cool? Okay, let's do resiliency, gals. Resiliency is the capacity to recover and adjust after difficulties. Champions fall, hurt and fail just like us. But they have preset protocols to adapt and press on. Winners aren't always the most intelligent or even the strongest athletes in the event. They are often the individuals who respond with the best adjustments after misfortunes. You guys, what do you think causes pressure in tennis? Is there one thing or a bunch of things that, a bunch of topics that could cause pressure? That's great. So you can't just get subbed out if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Does that have to do with personality? Sometimes it does, I think, yeah. It's in playing styles, right? Yeah. Like, to me, I remember when I used to play pressure, to me it was, if I'm attacking more, that's applying pressure on them. I didn't like the pressure of a pusher retriever. They didn't attack me at all. They just get every, got every ball back until I stopped paying attention. So I'm, I might be ADD, I don't, I don't know. But, uh, how, how would the scoring system affect... Pressure. Isn't it designed to add pressure? Add in, add out. You can win 6-4, or you can lose 6-4, and next set starts at 0-0. Zero, zero. That's not fair. You, you just won four games. You know, in football, if you get 14 points, you still get to keep your 14. Not in tennis. You're back at zero. Opponent style affects it, right? What else? What could affect pressure? Not wanting to fail. Like yeah, that perfectionism, yeah. And... To me, failing is not playing at your peak performance level. It's, it's, it's not about winning or losing. And an analogy I like to use, that was a good point about failing. Let, let's say you guys, your kids are in uh, a figure skating competition. Not even tennis, figure skating. So they get into this national, Madison Square Garden, right, figure skating. The best they've ever done in their lives is 8.6 with all the judges. They hold up the score. 8.6. Now they get a 9.4. Half hour later, a Russian girl comes up and gets a 9.5, she wins. Does that mean your, your athlete sucked and failed? No, they went from 8.6 to 9.4. Their performance, they exceeded their performance, right? And that's important that we kind of nurture that, especially with parents, because sometimes parents can sabotage that a little bit. Um, the creative line callers, AKA cheaters, does that add pressure? Yeah. I mean, you go play the ITF, if it's add in, add out, and your ball's in by two feet, that finger goes up. Does it work in reverse, too? Because like, a lot of people will make bad line calls because they're under so much pressure. Good react, point. Yeah. They just react and not really pay attention. Yeah, they don't pay attention. There's something also uh, called motion blur. When you're moving and landing, your eyes are moving in your sockets and you're legally blind. That's why sometimes when you teach people to hit things like overheads, if you can get them to pose and freeze, their eyes stop moving and they can see it clearly and hit it. If they're moving and falling all the time, 
motion blur. You get it? That's a good point. I didn't write that down. Can I steal that? Sure. Thanks. How about the draws and the seatings? Could that add pressure? Either way, right? You're, I'm playing the toad or I'm playing the top seat. Uh, could spectators add pressure? Yeah, right? How about your untrustworthy backhand? If you have a bad mechanical flaw in a stroke, you know it, they know it, everybody watching knows that you have no backhand, <laughs> and you know they all know. That's pressure. Uh, the opponent's fluctuating tactics. We see it a lot in juniors. The player comes out, hard-hitting baseline, and our player wins 6-3. Now the other kid's dad puts his hat around backwards. That's the international sign of begin pushing, Joey. And now the kid starts hitting high and higher. Moon ball begins. Now you're down 0-3. You were just up. You had different styles. Uh, could lack of fitness cause pressure? Yeah. How many of us have bailed out and gone for a crazy-ass winner down the line because you're too tired to run more? That's me. I'm like, I made this once in 1986. <laughs> I go for it. Uh, anyway, there's other topics, but let's go through the goal setting, girls. Goal setting is the process of identifying something that you want to accomplish with measurable goals. Dreams are a great start, but the work begins with those specific performance and goals and outcome goals of actual plans and target dates. Setting so daily, monthly, and long term goals build the emotional strength of PC. Very cool. I like the idea about action plans with target dates. Target dates is pretty important, I think. Now, do you think that you're the parents of all your juniors? Are they going to just love you to death if you're teaching all these skills? Absolutely. It's a huge, hugely important. How about this is the next one, sticking to commitments? Commitments are obligations that restrict freedom of action. Staying loyal to a written action plan separates the champion from the part-time hobbyists. Hobbyists train when it's convenient. Committed athletes put their sport above their social calendar. Very cool. To me, a lot of the athletes, especially in California, but I do get to travel a lot, but a lot of the athletes that are super athletic, but you know deep down will never be great, they're the ones that continually break promises to themselves. They say, their actions say, I'm going to do this weekly plan. Or sorry, their, their words say, I'm going to do the plan. Their actions say, I'm too busy, my friends are going to the mall, we're going to play War of the World Craft on video games instead of practicing. So they, they kind of they break promises to themselves. Those are the kids that usually don't become great. It has nothing to do with their physical skill. Sometimes they're the best athlete in the group. Okay, determination? Determination is the power to persist with a singular fixed purpose. Relentlessly determined to reach your goals. Champions often begin as average athletes with a normal determination. Do you guys ever see YouTubes of uh, the top players in the world, but when they were 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Were they great, or were they just average? They were good. They were better than average. They were good for right? What do you think? Were, they, well, how, were their mechanics all set? Or? No. But you saw, like, work ethic, and you saw... There. The mechanics were inside of there, but it's just not in yeah. an adult body. Yeah. And so they don't have the years of experience along with them. Yeah, so I think it's okay that we really... Nurture that with our juniors as they're going up through their rankings. It's okay to be crummy. You don't need to be perfect at everything. And when I was in, in Southern Cal for about six years, I got to work with Pete Sampras. He said in his last seven, eight years of playing pros, he didn't trust his topspin backhand. He didn't use it, didn't have it, didn't really like it. So, but he won you know, U.S. Opens without a major shot. I think that's, that's okay. Um, but he works on everything. He worked on everything. Okay, last couple. We're running, we're running through this stuff. I know you guys are getting a little antsy with this stuff. It's too many life skills for us pros to deal with. Okay, what's spotting? Is that the next one? Uh, problem solving. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Uh, problem solving skills. Identifying the problem is only the first step. Step two is to isolate the causes of the problem. Step three is then to customize the solution to the problem. Creative problem solving requires digging deeper wow. than simply identifying the flaw. Let's do the next one. Spotting patterns and tendencies. 
patterns and tendencies are an individual's predisposition to be a energy. Spotting and reoccurring behavior is essential in understanding your strengths and weaknesses as well as defeating a worthy cool. Very cool. Let's skip on over to preparation skills. Like, huh? yeah. Preparation skills. The life skill of being prepared is especially important in athletics. Preparing properly for battle is one of the most neglected aspects of intermediate athletes. Success stems from total preparation. It is truly the key to preventing a poor performance. Very cool. So match day preparation is something that I think is pretty important to really talk through. Um, we're going we're gonna to run through a few more of these, and we'll take a little bit of a, a breather so we can just stretch a little bit. But uh, how many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have had your students in the finals of national tournaments? Cool. Because you know, hardcore, super nationals, that kind of stuff even. Okay, the people that, if you have, it's really interesting. When you go to the finals, guess how many people are there watching? Zero. There's the athlete, maybe their mom, the other athlete, maybe their mom, and an umpire, and then crickets. That's it. And you, the, you, kids think they're going to go and they're going to do autographs and interviews and no, none of that stuff is going to ever happen at the Nationals. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, the not even kids aren't even going to be that happy after they win a big National. You know what really makes them happy? Weekly progress and growth. If your kids are not getting stagnant, if you're not getting stagnant as a teacher, you want weekly progress, re weekly growth. So if you're already an expert at teaching mechanics, like hardware, if you're an expert at athleticism, beautiful. Now become an expert at the software. And you'll be way happier working because you're growing. You get it? You're progressing. That's important, I think. OK, uh, persistence, let's do, let's do that one. Uh, persistence is the continued passion of action in spite of opposition. You need constant energy devoted to your sport. Anything less means that you're a hobbyist. <clears throat> Persistence gets you, gets you to the top. Consistency with that persistent frame of mind keeps you there. I think I should say too though, it's okay to be a hobbyist. There's nothing wrong with that. To me it's just when the athletes, their words and actions don't match. Like you see Parents, for example, and sorry, sorry to harp on parents, but if you're a parent, parents, they put their kid in one private a week and two hours of clinics a week. They don't do any practice matches, no video, nothing, and then they get mad when the kid loses in tournaments. Whose fault is it? The little kid or the parents? Parents. They're not even, yeah, yeah, right. He's like in Atlanta, it's the coach's fault. All right, what do we got next? Self image? Okay, go. Go for it. Let's do it. Okay, dedication. Dedication is the quality of being committed to a purpose. Dedication to a sport requires passion and commitment to strive for daily improvement. Lazy, non-athletic people use the word obsessed to describe the dedicated athletes. You guys ever have friends when you were younger and you were really committed to tennis and they'd try to pull you out and they're like, come on, let's just go to the mall. Why do you need to practice all the time? Okay, last one. Positive self-image. Strong emotional aptitude starts with positive self-esteem. Trusting yourself is the key to competing freely. Changing the negative self-talk into positive internal dialogue is a great start. Revisit your score. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Oh. All right, so I'm just going to review, then we're going to take a five-minute break. After a five-minute break, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about the other free book you're getting, the Match Chart book, and then we'll be done. Is that cool? Okay, so here's the review. You take these scripts that I'm giving you. You sit with your group of players. You have them write down their answers and help them be proactive with their answers. Then you give them time to go stand somewhere quiet, and they have to record it into their cell phones. Get it? Then what you want to try to do is get these athletes to listen to their solutions two or three nights a week and definitely before tournament play. And you'll see a big difference in, in how they perform under pressure. Yep? What's the youngest age you would do this with? Uh, seven or eight. To me, it's not about age. It's about maturity. I have seven-year-olds that come 
and they can tell me Rafa Nadal's like first serve percentages in the French Open. I have seven year olds that come and they forget their shoes. But so it's not really an age issue. It's about maturity and how much do they love the game. Like you guys can see sometimes people are like lovers of the sport. Some kids don't really love it, but some do. So yeah. All right, you guys good for a little break? Oh good. Does everybody get the question? How do you convince a rec player? Uh, I think I would, I would start by m trying to motivate the athlete to what they're going to receive in college if they take it serious and go play college ball. So here's what I would say. My daughter played uh, full ride at USC. They gave her uh, books, computers, tuition, first crack at all the classes, which is big if you're paying for school and you want to get into this one chemistry class and you graduate. But you're not an athlete. They go, sorry, it's already full, but you can take pottery for six months. <laughs> and you're spending $25,000 on a pottery class. And the parents are like, oh, Jesus. Um, uh, USC is right in the middle of a bad part of LA. They gave my daughter, uh, they gave her uh, an apartment for rent in Hermosa Beach by the ocean um, and a full-time tutor. So I forget the guy's name. He was a great guy, but he would go to her classes whenever she couldn't. He would help her basically graduate. And so there's a lot of perks to go to being like athletic royalty, you know. But I would talk about what's motivating them to get good. All right, you guys good for a little five-minute break? All right. And we're done with this. You guys can put that away. She's winning about 34% behind the court, high 60% of the points she finishes when she's inside the court. So we go, look, Callie, we're not going to change your strokes. Just get inside the court. And she does that, and she wins three national titles in a row just by being inside the court. So she went from winning like 30 percentage to 60-something percent. So identify. And sometimes remember, it's, it, sometimes their opinion is wrong. Just because they're comfortable with something doesn't mean they're good at it. Get it? OK, last couple of these free charts. Depth of ground stroke chart, self-explanatory, error placement chart. Where does 70% of all the errors go? Net. net, right? You've heard this stat, right? Charting whether they hit net long or wide. Sometimes what we're doing really is we're offering proof to a thick-headed student. That's all we're doing. They go, look, Martha, man, you're, you have 84% of your shots in the net. Let's put the rope up and do air zones a little bit. They finally go, okay. Charting does really provide the proof. Length of point chart. Here's one of Craig's uh, tips, if I remember it correctly. 70% of all the points go one to through four hits. 20% of all the points go five to nine hits per point. And only 10% of the points go over 10 and, 10 and more, long rounds. Only 10%. So if you're out there getting your students hit 50 balls in, you're practicing on winning the 10%. If you're practicing serve plus one patterns, like top seven, now you're practicing controlling the 70%. Mega point chart. All you're doing is you're charting big points, add and add out game points. Who's winning more of the big points? And it pays, and one thing really that it boils down to, are they paying attention that it actually is a big point? That's the key. A lot of players don't even know it's a big point until it's over. They go, geez, that was just that it. I should have ran my script instead of just going rogue. Mega point. Serve placement chart. We talked about that a little bit. But I might have a lot of data, though, with this stuff. But serving, serving second serve to the forehand, players lose like 75% of the points when they serve to the, to the forehand. If they're second serves in the backhand, they're still in the game. That chart is very big. A, a buddy of mine is um, Sam Sumat. He coaches a lot of the WTA people, like Azarenka. Now he's with uh, what's the tallest man in the world. One of the biggest stats is second serve percentage. Are they winning or losing off second serve? Um, shot selection chart. Is a fun one you can do with juniors, and basically it's offense, neutral, defense, 
are they missing balls when the ball's deep in the in the defensive zone, or are they missing short balls on that? You guys ever find with offense neutral defense, you have juniors, I see it all the time. They get a deep ball penetrating deep in the corner, and they're going for offensive winners. And then they get a short ball, and they just stand there and, yeah. and they rally it back instead of moving into no man's land and going offense when they're supposed to. That's, that's big for me, shot selection. And the last one here is just basic unforced errors to winners. And I know it's hard to see, I'll leave it up here for you guys, but there's there's certain categories of all your winners and all your errors. And when you look at it, if you read on a horizontal plane, you can look at how many forehand winners or errors. Or game by game, you can look at errors to winners. So every game you can look at, for example, I try to identify are they are they minus two or not, which means to me, it's just my little way of saying they made two more errors than winners. So the top half is all their errors. The bottom is all their winners. If they make four unforced errors a game, four, two winners, they had a minus two. They usually don't win those games. So they have to at least get closer than, you know, three or four unforced errors a game. You'll, you'll see when you do this kind of chart, when you get it in the mail, what you'll see is that a lot of kids can only focus for about 20 minutes. You'll see their charts are pretty good for the first set. And then by the second set, it goes down here. You see way more errors. I think a lot of times our kids aren't used to focusing. Um, one thing I do in California, every private lesson I do has to be a two-hour lesson. Wow. So that's the length of a tough match. If you can't focus for two hours, you're probably not going to get somebody good. All right, so two hours. All right, you guys, I'm going to leave this here for you. If you have any questions about any topics we covered, uh, my email is on the back of all those books you have. Email me, and I'm going to hang right here if anybody wants to chat. All right? Good. You're done.